Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon.org. I'm here with John MacArthur. I'm here with, with Claude Barrera, a, a Cube alum. Welcome back. <laughs> Hi. It's good, good to, to see you again. Claude is a distinguished engineer with IBM, a longtime visionary in the storage community and a spokesperson for IBM. So uh, good to see you again. IBM Edge, the amazing event that you guys have put together. So congratulations on that. You must be feeling pretty good about it. Well, yeah, it's good to see this many people gather together to talk about storage, and you know, storage is kind of cool, interesting stuff, so we like talking to customers, and we like seeing each other, which is something we get to do at events like this. Yes, yeah, well, storage has always been interesting to us, right? I mean, it's sort of ebbed and flowed over the years, but um, IBM really reasserted its commitment to storage, I don't know, whatever, five, six, seven years ago, and we're starting to see the fruits of that labor. Um, talk about that a little bit, that sort of reassertion, that, that transformation. Well, um, so the one of the things that I think has changed quite a bit in the last uh, maybe three or four years, um, 10 years ago when we talked about SANS and we first got started in storage networking, um, storage people, at least in IBM and even across the industry, were talking to each other. So we were talking about how to, how to build better RAID stacks and better disk arrays and all that, and it was all really very self-contained. And in a company like IBM, where we talk about you know end-to-end -end user solutions and software and server stacks, et cetera, um, it was uh, it, we were sort of a bit of an outlier. And what's been happening in the last several years is storage gets more and more integrated into the rest of the system stack. So the question now is, how does the whole solution behave? And when you ask the question, how does the whole solution behave? Storage is along for the ride, along with networking and the software stack and security and administration and management. And you add things like the cloud idea, and now we're all sort of in, in one big pile and we have to work together and cooperate. So uh, storage is much less of an insular discipline in IBM now and probably around the industry mm -hmm. uh, than it's ever been. You've been waiting for this day for a while. Yeah. This is a good development <laughs> yeah. because we, we present ourselves together in front of the customer and say, let's let's talk about your overall business problem, the economics of the complete solution, not the individual components of it, mm -hmm. um, and, and what your requirements are. When you think about things that are like migration of some of the data or all of the data or some of the applications or all of the applications of the cloud, what, how do you think about, what does IBM have to contribute in the area of service level management for, for those kinds of applications that are going there? Well, um, so we come at it in probably three or four different ways. You know, that's usually us, right? We're we're broad and wide. And, the answer depends. Uh, is yeah. It depends. Right? Um, so, uh, some uh, some thoughts. Um, there are uh, cloud instances in which you're trying to solve a very specific problem. So I'm not trying to do all of IT. I'm just trying to do archive well, or I'm trying to provide a backup service to somebody that doesn't want to do their own backup or. Uh, off-site recovery for somebody who doesn't have a second site. Uh, so there are focused solutions around those. And we even work very directly with business partners. There's, a, uh, there's an outfit in, in Europe that has been building uh, backup cloud solutions using uh, TSM. Uh, so they've basically built their own cloud structure. The TSM is a client that you can download and install if you're the subscriber to this cloud service. and and the, the business partner stands up a TSM server as the, as the cloud service. Uh, and then for other environments, it's more comprehensive. I want a, a full IT stack to run not all IT applications, but a few. I want to be able to host virtual machines and do dev test, or I want to host a few virtual machines and do uh, collaboration. And, and there's a solution you put together around that. And that outsourcing business is pretty important to IBM. Uh, it, it is and it has been. And one of the big drivers of cloud deployment within IBM is the fact that SO accounts, which had been, you know, we'll take over your data center and run it as a data center because we're better at running data centers than you are, uh, is now morphing into, we've got these collections of data centers. Wouldn't it be great if we could cloudify them all uh, bring together multiple SO accounts uh, and achieve the economies of scale and the, uh, the variability of, of asset deployment according to you know, which, which uh, SO account is, is demanding more or less. Now there's new requirements that go with that around multi-tenant security, but that's, that's part of the work that has to be done around clouds. Yeah. 
And you also get act, you're also active in business process outsourcing, so going even another step further. Does does the information that you sort of you're able to capture there drive down into storage architectures and inform the product managers? Is it can can you build those connections, or is that too hard, um, too far a reach? Well, no, I would say it's a it's a very important part of of how business is done in storage. Um, if you go back all the way, like to the late 60s, that dialogue went on to create database. Basically, people at, uh, at Caterpillar said, gee, you know, we have, this, we have this need to deal with, they didn't have a good word for it, but we eventually called it transactions. <laughs> and people on the IBM research side said, oh, we understand more or less what you need. You need to be able to atomically do an operation and guarantee that it works and guarantee that it completely works. Um, so the, the dialogue now is around things like, um, how do you want to do analytics? So what transactional data are you receiving real time? And what insights do you need to be able to create real time as opposed to next month or tonight or uh, at some later date? So a transaction comes in, do I honor that transaction now or not? And what role does the infrastructure have to play in supporting that business requirement? So the only way you learn about important business requirements are about talking to the customers that actually have them. So in that vein, I mean, the more we talk about simplifying IT, the more complex IT gets. So what do you see as the big challenges that customers are facing? and How are you responding to them? Well, um, so you're right. The, the, uh, we want IT to be, appear to be simple. And the goal of, of vendors is actually to create uh, hidden complexity or hidden functionality. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the big problems that I think customers face, in particular vis-a-vis -vis storage, is the fact that they have way more data than they ever thought they were going to have. And there are, they have obligations as to how that data needs to be handled, how long it needs to be kept for regulatory purposes, uh, what security needs to be applied to it. Um, and they have to be able to do all of this affordably. So within the bounds of their economic model, uh, how do I make sure that as, as data comes in, it's not exposed incorrectly, it's kept for the right period of time and deleted after that, um, and that they obtain whatever business value can be obtained from it in a reasonable way. So it's a, it's a complicated equation of there's requirements I must meet or I shouldn't take on this responsibility of, of stewardship for data. Uh, but there's also business opportunities to be had for having it and using it and improving operational logistics. So the probably the single biggest point of discussion nowadays today is around the economics of owning of owning data. The economics of owning data, not owning not managing storage, but owning data. The economics of owning data. Like, I don't well, want so that, don't give me that data because I don't want the cost of managing well, it, or give me that well, data. that's the risk side. Right. There's a reward side. The reward I have side data I can I had, do, right, I can I improve can, my business with it. Yeah. Yeah, so we talk a lot about information asset and liability management, and it seems like the last 10 years we've been talking about the liabilities <laughs> of data. Right? It's big, it's expensive, it's growing, I can't manage it, compliance, um, security, privacy. And then, all boom, big data comes on the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and there's certainly a vision being put forth that the, the scale is going to tilt toward the asset side. Um, do you buy that? Where are we in the game of, uh, um, of, of value creation around data becoming more of an asset than a liability? Well, I think we're, I think we're well down the road of, of data being an asset. I think there's lots of industries where uh, it's already well in play, certainly financial services and and anything involving logistics. Uh, I should clarify, I should clarify. I'm really talking about a step function in that asset value creation. So yes, and I, I totally agree. There's many, many industries that are very data-driven, mm -hmm. you know, Nicholas Negroponte, you know, model. Sure, right. But the industry is promising a, a huge uplift, a huge step function in that value creation. And I'm, I'm curious as to, yeah. You know, data warehousing didn't deliver. Some, data Mart sort of Somebody's been around for a while and right. seen a lot of, right. as John's saying, sort of failed initiatives. Is, is big data different? Um, well, so of course the answer is going to be partly we'll see. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, think there's, I think there's lots of reasons to believe that uh, for a number of problems that society faces, 
uh, we're going to have to have all the efficiency in in our uh, delivery models for food, for clean water, for uh, regulatory compliance across lots of different industries. In our society, that becomes increasingly complex. The idea that people are just going to get this right through smart people looking at printed reports that are three, four, five days old by the time they, they get looked at uh, just isn't the model any longer. The speed at which modern processes work uh, and, the, and the scale of them uh, and the dependency that humans have on these processes working properly requires that we do a better job. And uh, I, I personally am, am very confident that the uh, uh, enhancements that come along with data-driven uh, business judgment uh, are going to prove important. Now, one of the leading areas of, of application of analytics is around things like Homeland Security. Uh, knowing that there's enough information out there if I were to put the pieces together properly to maybe steal a, a, a metaphor from, from uh, Jeff Jonas, uh, if I were to put the material together properly and derive the insights that I need, I could prevent uh, the next bad thing from happening uh, or fraud from happening. I mean, it doesn't have to be disaster scale. It could just be theft. Um, so those kinds of insights derived from data through analytics, uh, I think will be commonplace in our future. Yeah, at, this, at the same time, when you think about the, um, when you think about, uh, we use the Homeland Security example of, you know, how many people get stopped? What's the impact on sort of efficiency of air travel, for example? Um, dealing with the false, false positives or the false maybes, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to dealing with the, uh, the you know, the, the positives right. or, or the or the false negatives. So, so um, that balance between uh, be, between being able to analyze data quickly uh, and ingest new data, but maintaining privacy such that we can d deal with some of those issues. You know, I think that's where some of the some of the big big challenges are. Today. Yeah, I agree. And and then at a more pedestrian level, there's the the pure question of what does all this cost to keep? If I as I acquire data at a enormous rate with with uh, very sensitive sensors that keep uh, that collect you know really large scale objects, what does it cost me to to capture those things and to have them sitting around for long periods of time? Yeah, you guys have some announcements this uh, that that you're doing around real-time data compression. You, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, compression's been around for a long time in, in data storage, uh, but we've really only used it for very cold data. For example, we've been doing tape compression for, I don't know, 15 years or something like that. Um, because the, the uh, uh, computational overhead associated with doing the compression was viewed to be uh, onerous. Uh, and you even, had a, you even had a, uh, a, a side processor on the mainframe to handle compression. That's right, yeah. You know, hard hardware compression. So what we're, what we're doing now through, through uh, you know, innovative uh, analytic technology in, in software uh, is doing real-time compression of online data as it is received by, uh, by a disk array. So uh, applications and middleware and operating systems are, are completely unaware that this is happening. Uh, but the capacity of the storage is uplifted by a factor of two to two and a half to maybe up to four, depending on what the what the data is, with not only no performance degradation, but in some cases even performance improvement, because you're actually writing less data on the slow physical disks. Hmm. And and the rehydration of data uh, from a compressed state, what's that? What's that? Like? Um, actually, the the arithmetic uh, compression algorithms, Lempel-Zev in this case. Uh, rehydrate very easily, so that that part actually is not uh, computationally taxing at all. We were talking earlier a little bit about flash, and I know in this session before, uh, Mark Peters from ESG was uh, talking about uh, talking about flash a bit. Um, there's um, there's sort of a there was a, a speech that um, that uh, that that uh, Steve Duplessis gave at EMC World, saying, "Don't worry about you know quality of flash. Don't worry about." Or write uh, my algorithms better than your algorithm. Don't worry about this. All that stuff's going to be taken care of. Just buy Flash, put it everywhere. What's what's your uh, sort of thinking around Flash? Well, um, so I 
I, I know Steve and, and, and think he's a lot of fun. Um, when he's saying, uh, don't worry about any of that stuff, uh, I assume his audience is the, the actual end users. Yeah, he uh, means Claude's going to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so what Steve is saying is that the vendors will have, have spent many hours in the lab making sure this is really all okay. Um, there actually is a lot of work to do. So Flash as a technology was not picked by us enterprise guys. If, if we, the enterprise community, had picked a, a technology, it would not have been Flash. Uh, Flash you, is, is uh, it, it wears out if you do too many writes to it. The read-write ratio is, or the read-write speed is imbalanced. Uh, you have to reclaim space. You have to right? reclaim space and do garbage collect. Yeah. And like, like, so the ice, like the iceberg from uh, storage tech right. days. Thank God yeah, you, got you enterprise guys right. weren't picking yeah. it, though. You know? yeah. Thank so you, Steve Jobs. Garbage collection is a, is a good technology. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. So <laughs> what, what Steve is saying is a lot of really smart people will have taken care of that problem. But the fact remains that there is big, important work to do to take this componentry that was selected by the tablet guys and the smartphone guys because their requirements are no moving parts and low battery usage and, uh, and take this technology that really isn't very good at the enterprise job and clothe it with enough uh, other technology, uh, over-provisioning, write elimination, uh, uh, garbage collect, uh, um, and, and therefore make it a reliable technology at the enterprise level. So, um, and you hear a lot of you know, true, true blue, no, no, no pun intended, but tried and true enterprise guys sort of saying that. Um, and then there's the volume mm -hmm. and the pricing, right? So right. do you feel like that ec the economics, uh, the price of Flash is going to overwhelm those, those drawbacks? Or do you expect, I mean, you guys are, I'm sure, inventing technologies. You hear a lot about HP Mem Mem Store and, and others. Will, will Flash, you know, be there 10 years from now? It doesn't even matter. Well, um, it's a little hard to say. The, there is certainly a window of opportunity for other technologies to, to supplant Flash. And uh, remember, remember what I said about it's the cell phone guys and the tablet guys that do the picking. Um, they don't care about performance and they don't care about uh, uh, write endurance or anything like that because they don't do enough writes. And there's not a lot of performance required in your cell phone. But they do care about cost. And if a new, better technology can come along which costs less, which means the cell guys and the tablet guys will use it, and has better write endurance and better read-write uh, performance, now we're talking. So you, the, the, the premise that consumerization will drive this Absolutely. stands. Right. You're not debating that whatsoever. Right. And all problems will be solved in software. Uh, the cover-up will the be done in the software. Cover up is done. <laughs> that, that, yeah, the, the making the it all cover up, the right? making it all appear you know really robust will happen right. in enterprise software. Okay. So a couple other questions. I'm just going to run down them. So to knob or not to knob? What do you what do you think? Uh, I'm talking about you know turning knobs. Oh, and turning sort of, knobs and sort of well, automation. Um, and so there's so there's three schools. There's one school that says zero knobs is the right number, and just put it in. The thing works. Uh, I don't I don't mess with it. Don't touch it. Um, there, is, uh, there is the school that says uh, uh, enough knobs to, to appropriately pick uh, in the vocabulary of business policy. So I want to be able to turn a knob and say my business policy is uh, my data does not leave my geo uh, or my country because there's laws that say that that must be so. So I don't want you to just say it's all baked in, don't worry about it. I want some proactive action on my on my part to say I made this decision there it is you know I can prove that I I took act um, the third school is um, placebo knobs where you, people have steering wheels but they don't actually do anything and and there is that's right that's exactly right and and I think there's plenty of evidence that that those things have value the the database people not to name any names have been diligently crafting their algorithms for inner diameter versus outer diameter on disk, even though we've had five layers of storage virtualization between them and the physical disk drives for, you know, 10 years. So they're happy, we're happy, everybody's happy. And, <laughs> that's cool. Right? And, you know. <laughs> he thinks he's getting the outer disk. That's right. The outer yeah. Disk, yeah. Okay, so where do you stand in that spectrum? Um, I think the, the uh, by customer segment, there will be people that say, I actually do want some knobs that reflect business policy. And I think, there's the, I think there's also the pure appliance model. 
I think there are there are people in. that would say drop it in. It does a known thing. Just get out of the way. Uh, but um, for certain industries, there is a certain vocabulary and a certain set of practices that I think will be long-term enduring. Okay, another topic: object storage. Any quick thoughts there. Um, object storage, I believe, has found its role in life. Um, so we first started talking about object stores back in, I don't know, 92, 94. Uh, there was a little buzz around it, but nobody could really explain what it was for. And I think the thing that we have landed on is uh, it's for uh, internet scale access with uh, individual level multi-tenant security for people all over the world to get a data repositories. And the, the confluence of technology seems to be REST APIs, which are nice and simple and have lots of security controls that can be applied to them. Uh, and the very simple put get interface that doesn't involve a lot of risk of exposure or you know people, people might be able to hack into it that, that are present in some of the NAS uh, protocols. Um, and the use case is now ready. So there are people all over the world that take photos on their, on their cameras, on their digital cameras, and want to put it somewhere where it'll be saved if their house floods or burns down. Um, so the, the use case is there, the technology is there, and the rest of the, of the technology access is, is, yeah, is so awesome. Part of that is the metadata that you encapsulate. That's right, yeah. That just really opens up a whole new sets of value that can be created. Right. Um, how about unified storage? Um, unified storage, I think, is, is also a, a, a thing whose time has come, and, and it'll be even yet more unified when people start adding object store protocols to what they already have with block storage and NAS storage. So that would be your definition of truly unified. Ultra, right? ultra unified. <laughs> Just, look, here's your data. You know, you pick whatever vocabulary you like, here it is, tin cans and string, uh, and your box will accept. And, and my last question is, will all active data be on flash? And of course, I'm going to say, if so, when? Um, so there's certainly one school of thought that says what you need in the long run is active data on something that's fairly high speed, and then the data tub, uh, either real low speed, uh, very low cost disk, and or tape yet behind that. Um, that's probably a viable model. Uh, it remains to be seen what the, what the cost of flash is actually going to turn out to be. Right now it's still probably 10 to 20x enterprise flash versus uh, spinning disk. Uh, if that were to go to 5x, then you're probably ready for a truly two-tier model. It doesn't flash have to cross flash if you apply enough so. compression, deduplication, and stuff like that, can you? Yeah, and you and you layer those on top of any media technology you like, and and they add, they add value to whatever the media might be. Start to get some economics. It might make sense. With That's the, right. With the added performance, right. where you could do a lot. On, yeah. Okay. All right, Claude. Really appreciate you coming on. Okay, well, it's always uh, a pleasure to see you guys. Yeah. Take care. Thank you very much Thanks, for sharing your perspective. Thank you. Good to see you again. Uh, Claude Barrera, uh, distinguished engineer, uh, chief technical strategist for the IBM storage portfolio. Uh, great to have you back. Uh, thanks for watching, so keep it right there. We're going to be back to wrap this segment of uh, IBM Edge. Uh, we are live. This is theCUBE, SiliconAngle.tv's continuous coverage from Orlando. Keep it right there. <laughs>